Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, webinar by BenQ. This is part of our AccuColor webinar series. Uh, today, we're thrilled to have Shiv Verma present um, time lapse imagery today. Uh, we're going to take some questions here and there throughout the webinar, but if you have any uh, questions, we can hold off to the end. We'll definitely have Q&A and we'll try to get everybody's questions answered. Uh, Shiv, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, thank you to BenQ for having me here. This is my first uh, BenQ AccuColor webinar. Um, for the most part, uh, we are trying to uh, establish a relationship whereby you know the BenQ products becomes part of my lifestyle, uh, which it already has, and in the most part. Uh, what I'm really enjoying about the product is my ability not only to have extremely fast uh, screen refresh rates, accurate color, and, and the ability to really, uh, you know, do a comparison from what I've been using in the past. And I don't want, don't want to negate any products, but uh, quite honestly, it's, uh, it, it's been an eye opener. Um, with that said, um, Personally, I uh, am a Lumix uh, Global Ambassador, so uh, I do utter some words about Lumix cameras, etc. Uh, don't take that amiss. Um, I also do uh, a fair amount of work with x and with Wacom. So uh, with that said, let's uh, just get on with the topic of the evening, which is time-lapse imagery. And what I want you to do is, through this presentation, you will see a few videos. And in those videos, I want you to not just look at it from an entertainment point of view, but I want you to look at it from a critical point of view. And then uh, we will discuss some issues and we will discuss some non-issues. Um, funnily enough, there are times when one thinks that something has gone wrong. Uh, but in reality, it hasn't gone wrong. And then at times we think, well, it looks okay, but in fact, there are a number of issues with it. So I, I want you to to pay uh, careful attention as to what it is that you know we are uh, showing, and from that you will get an understanding as to how to resolve uh, some of the issues that happen when we are creating time lapse videos, time lapse images. Uh, or time-lapse sequences, however you want to define it. So watch the uh, the first of the these videos, which is actually my opening screen. And tell me if you think it's good, bad, or indifferent. Just keep it in your head. We're not going to do a Q&A about it. But if you noticed, you know, the clouds kind of move nice and smooth, and then there's a person that looks like stop motion animation going on at the bottom. So it, at times that is effective, but then at times that becomes a distraction. So it really depends upon what it is that you want to show and how it is that you want to show it that helps you in the creation of your time lapse sequence. So that's just one quick example of what may transpire uh, you know, particularly when you're doing things uh, with uh, time lapse in crowded places or where there are a lot of people moving about, uh, doing activity, and you may say, well, it, that's exactly what I want to represent, and that's fine. Or uh, somebody may say, well, that's a bit of a distraction, and how do you fix it? So we'll be dealing with all of that. Uh, but more importantly, let's let's first talk about what it is that we are going to deal with today. So. Quick overview about time lapse. What equipment uh, should one use, and how do you use it most appropriately? And then we're going to delve into uh, what are the various durations and intervals that become critical for creating a good time lapse sequence. Uh, intervalometers, how to use them and how to program them, and then what the actual capture and exposure and white balance issues are. Uh, we will deal with uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, we end up seeing with uh, time-lapse capture is Flickr and how to control it. And then we'll, we'll talk briefly about the holy grail of time-lapse and then deal with some animation and video assembly. So with that said, uh, 
it's it's important to understand what time lapse is about and why why we do things like time lapse so think about yourself as a human being and most human beings have very little patience um, our, our attention span runs pretty good for about 10 15 odd seconds maybe you know 20 maybe 30 uh, beyond 30 you're kind of stretching it and the expectation for something that lasts you know, more than 30 seconds and for you to fully sort of absorb it and appreciate it uh, tends to be problematic and we as humans being impatient tend to disregard anything that is way too long but it is important to understand that there are things that take place over a period of time so things that take place over a period of time we never get to see uh, just to, to throw out a quick example we all love you know to look at a beautiful rose but have we ever looked at how a rose went from being a bud to the flower uh, if you were to watch that happen that would probably take a day and a half to two days and you'd have to stare at it uh, for it to really transpose itself from being that bud to becoming a flower but if you could watch that whole process in a matter of 10 15 seconds you would have a much better appreciation as to what really transpired in that transition from being that bud to being a, becoming a flower so what i'm basically saying is that you need to understand how much time it's going to take for something to transpire and then you're going to try and figure out how to take all of that time and compress it down uh, in your images to create a 10 or a 30 second product. And that product is your time-lapse video sequence or whatever you want to call it as a time-lapse movie or a, a, you know, just a time-lapse image. So that's what we're dealing with. And the more we deal with things like that, the more troublesome it becomes and more problematic it becomes because of what we use to create it. If you're watching this, try and understand what all is going on and what all has gone wrong. So I'm going to replay it so that you can appreciate what I'm going to talk about. First and foremost, this was a fairly long sequence taken over a period of about 35 minutes. Um, the clouds were moving nice. There was not much change as far as exposure is concerned, as far as the light's concerned. Uh, there are about 450 images that were captured to create this time lapse, but my sensor was dirty. I had a spot splat in the middle, as you can see it. Uh, you know, lower center, there's a diagonal speck that needs to have been removed. But if I haven't removed that before taking these images, I'm now going to have to edit 450 images to get rid of that spot. That's no joy. And when you get rid of that spot, even if you use a batch process in things like Photoshop or Lightroom, every image sequentially has a difference because the clouds behind it in this particular case are not going to be in the same position. So when Photoshop corrects for a spot, it's basically cloning from a similar area to resolve for what you're trying to correct. But what it is using, if it is a batch process, it's going to use it from the same place over and over again. But what it is going to use from has constantly changed over the sequence. So the spot becomes not a removal, but it becomes a bit more of a distraction. So it's probably better than just to leave the spot alone. The second thing that transpired, if you noticed, was 
Yes, everything was fine. The clouds were moving and all that was great. But then it started raining. Now, a lot of people think they're birds that are flying around, etc. But it's not. It's really rain. So let's just watch this one more time. So hopefully you get the idea. Now, what could have been done? Well, the sequence is really more than 10 seconds. All I nearly need is 10 seconds to show what was happening. So I could have just edited the video and stopped it 10 seconds before the rain started, and I would have been okay. And if you put this in and assemble it with other time-lapse sequences or other video to make it a more complete story, then this sequence would fit in just perfectly without any distractions. So keep those things in mind. Okay, so what are we really trying to achieve as far as time lapse is concerned? Go back to video capture. Video capture was typically done at 24 frames a second. And then that video was shown on screen at a movie theater or wherever, even at home, at the same rate, at 24 frames a second. So the speed of capture and the speed of display were both identical. So 24 frames a second basically is a visual representation from one frame to the other where the eye does not perceive it to be jerky or staccato. It is a very comfortable visual sequence where our brain can clearly understand that it is a continuum rather than a broken set of images. So 24 frames was then basically considered or made into a standard because of how we see it. Now, however, if you capture the same sequence at 12 frames a second, and now you're gonna show it on your, I'm gonna go back to the projector that showed video at 24 frames a second, then you get this fast motion. You get everything appearing to move twice as fast as when it was captured. Conversely, if you were to shoot 50 frames in a second and then show them at 24 frames, you're basically going to end up with what we call slow motion. So half motion, half slow motion, twice as fast, or four times slow motion, or four times as fast, it all depends upon how many frames are captured and how they are shown. We are always going to show our videos at the same frame rate because that's how things are projected. So typically, in today's standards, we do 24 frames a second, we do 30 frames a second, and now for more smooth video, we are even looking at 60 frames a second. Now, 30 frames a second. Uh, it's from a from a video point of view for time lapse is perfectly okay. We don't have to use the standard, which is 29.xx, to be able to do it. So just just let's look at it as a 30 frame per second capture. So when we are doing lots of frames over a great period of time, but showing it at 24 or 30 frames a second, we are basically taking all of that and compressing it down into a much shorter period. And you'll get to see that a little bit more. So what's the kind of subject matter that is good for at least a starter when you want to do time lapse, if you want to start with you know, working on creating some videos maybe tonight or, or tomorrow? Melting ice is a good way to start. Baking cookies is a good way to start. Uh, going out and creating some uh, time lapses of street scenes. Uh, just some clouds if you have clouds in the sky. Uh, as long as it, they're not you know, dark and aboding stationary clouds, there's got to be some movement for you to create a level of interest. Sunrises, sunsets becomes a little more complex, but clearly doable.
and then of course stars trails all these are called short duration subject matter it happens fairly quickly sunrises and sunsets typically happen within you know half an hour to 45 minutes um, ice or ice cream as a good example melts within one hour so you only have to be patient for one hour but now if you look at some long duration subjects like flowers or while you're building your home or you know seeds that sprout etc you're looking at hours and hours and sometimes days and sometimes months and sometimes even years of capture time before you can get to it so it does surely require a lot of patience for you to be able to do it so what do we use to to you know capture time lapse what's the equipment any camera will work any camera that is capable of doing frame by frame capture if your camera does not have internal systems to allow you to do that there are external devices that we will talk about that will let you do frame by frame capture there are even video cameras that can do frame by frame capture so be aware of the fact that if you don't have anything which is like a dslr or a mirrorless camera you can use other cameras that will let you do it as long as you can capture individual frames one after the other sequentially lenses of course you can't take any photographs without lenses as always you know just as in photography we say you know buy the best glass you possibly can uh, yes buy the best glass you possibly can but for time lapse don't overspend and by that i mean is you don't have to buy lenses that have image stabilization you don't have to buy lenses that are uh, automatic you want manual lenses and you will soon see why you want lenses where you can control the aperture manually you want lenses where you can focus manually you want lenses that don't have stabilization and don't have autofocus so the more manual you can get the better now you may say well, well my camera doesn't have any manual lenses well that's where the fun comes in because you can buy very good manual lenses excellent glass at very reasonable prices and then just buy an adapter to fit on your camera now you can use adapters with mirrorless cameras far easier than you can with the old dslrs because of the flange distance and we can get into that if you want but adapted lenses work beautifully with mirrorless cameras so keep that in consideration and where a good lens you know may cost you a few you know thousand dollars you can get the equivalent in a manual lens in an old good manual lens for about the third uh, or even a fourth of the price nd filters they are time lapses best friend now we talk about ND filters in a slightly different way. We are basically looking at ND filters that are going to allow you to use larger apertures, let you have shallow depth of field, allow you to slow your shutter speed down, and you want to be able to create a quasi motion blur so that one frame to the next has a fluid flow without any jerkiness we get to un understanding the reason why we need a neutral density filter that is variable rather than neutral density filters that are fixed so you, you know you can buy variable nd filters that go from you know two stops of uh, darkening all the way up to 10 stops of darkening or you can buy ND filters that are fixed, like a two-stop, three-stop, five-stop, six-stop, eight, ten, and so on. Even what's now becoming fairly popular is a 15-stop ND filter. Good supports. What you don't want is your camera to lose registration. Once you've set it up to do time-lapse, the tripod must remain in the same place. The camera must remain in the same place unless you are looking at doing animation, which we will talk about later. But for right now, you don't want your registration to change 
because if it does through your sequence, then you're going to get a fair amount of jerkiness that is happening in your video. If you're using a tripod, make sure the tripod is solid. And even if you have a good tripod, don't extend the thinnest legs. Don't extend the last set of legs for your uh, you know, time-lapse sequence. They are the weakest, they are the thinnest, and they are the ones that cause the most vibration as far as your tripod is concerned. In the most part, you want to do your time-lapse in non-windy situations. Because despite the fact that you have a good solid tripod, the moment you put your camera on top, you are going to end up with a slight amount of vibration because of breeze. Also, make sure that you remove any camera straps because they will flap around and cause all kinds of issues. The lower you are to the ground, the more stable you're going to be. So think about products like the Platypod, think about ground pods. They're great for low level shooting, but they're also great for stability. Right now, Platypod has got a huge set of discounts going on on their website, but they are not discounting any of their individual products. If you want to get any of their individual products, use my discount code, which is up here, SV20, and you can get a 20% discount on anything, including their really beautiful uh, ele electronic level indicated head, uh, which is you know, a good, good amount of uh, money that you can save. Um, ball heads, pan and tilt heads all work well as long as they are good and solid. A lot of you talk about stabilizing your tripods by using the center hook. And you know, people will say, well, hang your bag from the center hook or, or hang something heavy from the center hook. Please don't do that. Because the moment you hand your, hang your bag from your tripod center hook, your bag is becoming a nice big sail. And that sail is going to be impacted by the slightest breeze. And instead of stabilizing your tripod, it's going to make it more unstable and more vibration prone. So just don't do that. If you do want to use your center hook, then go and buy some paracord, which is non-expandable, doesn't stretch. Uh, you can buy it at, uh, you know, Home Depot, you can buy it at uh, Joanne Fabrics, wherever you want. And then get what's known as a ground anchor. It's used for pets. Um, it's got a, like an auger, it's got a, like a screw mechanism. So you can tie your paracord to the center hook, tie it to the ground anchor, and then you know screw the ground anchor into the ground. You will have a very stable tripod system when you do things like that. And oh, by the way, it's not just for time lapse, it's for any kind of work that you want to do where you want to minimize the amount of vibration or minimize the amount of uh, you know, subject move that, are, that is represented on your sensor. So things like you know, stacked images, things like macro photography that require you know, multiple sequencing of focus point stacking, all of that can really be, uh, can benefit from a system like this. As far as intervalometers are concerned, this really is the heart and soul for you to create your time lapse. Uh, there are multiple intervalometers. You have cameras that have built in intervalometers. They work the best, I think, because you don't have to carry an external device. Uh, if an external device is not wireless, then you're going to have something else dangling from your camera, which can in turn cause other issues. Uh, you've got, you know, Devices that will allow you to do what's known as bramping, and we'll talk about bramping in a bit, but those are pretty advanced and pretty expensive, but do do a phenomenal job. Uh, you can use uh, software that uh, allows you to use things like your iPhone or your Android phone, or if you are really doing a lot of you know sequential time lapse indoors. Um, under controlled environments with lights and things of that sort, use your computer to do time lapse through tethered uh, shooting. As far as lights are concerned, we are always looking for the least amount or, uh, if possible, no variation in f stops. And it's not just variation in f stops by terms of 
a full F stop, like going from, you know, a light variation of F4 to F5, 6, or 5, 6 to F4, and you know, 8 to 5, 6, and so on. We're looking at variations that are not one third of an F stop, but variations that are one one hundredth, one one thousandth of an F stop. You don't want any variation wherever you can help it. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, where you will control those variations in a sequential way, where you are going to do a time lapse of sunrises, some time lapse of sunsets, or a bit of both. Um, you can resort to doing shooting with you know, aperture priority and allowing your time lapse interval being managed at the longest exposure, but that's not the way I'd like to do it. So you end up using what's known as a bramping device. Bramping devices are bulb ramping devices. What you'd have to do is to set your camera up in bulb mode, and then this particular electronic device controls your exposure. Now remember one thing, your camera's exposure settings can be varied in either full stops, half stops, or one-third stops, nothing in between. But when the sun is rising or the sun is setting, it doesn't rise and set with light changing in one-third stop increments. It's a very gradual change. So a bulb ramping device will allow for a change of light to be registered at one one-thousandth of a stop. And that's how you get these very smooth sequences of day, day to night and night to day time lapses. So let's let's get to the 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 meat of frame durations and and intervals. What we're dealing with is if you go back to the old film days, the film camera that took video basically had an aperture that allowed light in. And behind that aperture was a shutter that was not like the shutters that we use today, but the shutter was basically a circular shutter. And that shutter had half of it open and half of it closed, and it spun around 360 degrees for each frame. So it basically exposed the frame half the time, and the other half the time there was no exposure. So for a full frame duration, you got exposure, the film got dark, light hit it, film got uh, no light for the remaining half. So when you're shooting at 24 frames a second, for each 1 24th of a second, your film was only exposed for 1 48th, half that time. The remainder, the shutter remained closed. So movie film typically was being photographed at 1 48th of a second, but since we don't have 1 48th of a second in our cameras, we have 1 50th of a second, we can do a little cheating and we can use 1 50th of a second. So with that, the longer you have the exposure, and the less time you give for the dark area, you'll get smoother and smoother and smoother motion. However, you don't want to get so smooth that now the entire sequence looks blurry. If you are taking very short exposures during the course of that single frame, you're going to end up with very jerky motion. So you have to balance it out. And that 50-50 is a balance. So the term that you might have heard of is, in video, I use a 180 degree shutter. With nothing more than 180 degrees out of 360, where you were exposing for half the time and not for the other half. In order to create good time lapse, that is the kind of exposure we are also bringing into play. So, if you think about it, the way we achieve it is that if you are going to be showing your video at 30 frames a second, 
then your shutter speed needs to be 1 60th for each of those frames. That's kind of difficult in broad daylight. How do you shoot at, let's say, even f16 and 1 60th of a second in broad daylight at ISO 100? You can't achieve that. So the only way to achieve that is now to put a neutral density filter so that you can make the amount of light entering your sensor less to allow you for that 1 60th of a second shutter speed and whatever aperture you want to use. Just like in all video, we want shallow depth of field for it to look cinematic and beautiful. So you're not going to be using f16. You're going to be using f8, f4, even f2.8. And as you do that, more and more light is going to come in. So more you have to control that light. But if you put a two-stop or a four-stop or a 10-stop ND filter, yes, you can bring the light down, but it may never end up at 1 60th of a second. You put a variable neutral density filter on and you can bring it very carefully by turning that in very small increments, you can bring your camera to register good exposure at 1 60th of a second. That is what we're trying to do. So for all of this, right, I've already sort of discussed this entire thing. We have to make sure that we are looking at our resulting sequence to have been shot at half the frame rate of exposure. So 50% on, 50% off, resulting in 1 60th of a second. Now, where this breaks down, or where you can change it, is use 1 50th of a second if you're shooting or going to be displaying at 24 frames a second. But where this breaks down is in day to night sequences or night sequences, where particularly beyond a certain point in time, in order to be able to capture what it is that you're photographing, you are going to require far more than 1 60th of a second. Like if you're going to be doing star trails, or if you're going to be doing the Aurora Borealis, or if you're going to be doing anything else that is going to be photographed at night, you're looking at 15, 20, maybe even 25 second exposures. It's okay, because in those cases, you are gathering light and the blurriness is something that is going to literally interplay sequentially because you want the stars to look like they're trailing. You want the, the aurora borealis to look like it's a smooth veil or a smooth flow. You want that light to become kind of fluid, if I may use that term, to demonstrate what it is that that time lapse is really trying to show. So that's where you can get away with this, but during most other sequences, you want to be representing your imagery at you know, 50% on, 50% off. So as I said before, capturing between 24 and 30 frames a second, the greater the frames per second, the smoother your play playback will be. So my preference typically for all the time lapse that I do I use 30 frames a second. And th this, is, this chart is just nothing more than an example of what you can do for various types of short duration subject matter or fast moving subject matter and slow or slow transitioning subject matter. So for air road travel or city scenes, one second intervals are fine. Sunrises and sunsets, one to three seconds based upon you know, what you're doing. Slow moving clouds, you can even extend it to five seconds. If you're going to be doing the moon going across the sky or you're photographing stars, Milky Way, that type of stuff, you're looking at 15, 20, 25, a maximum of 30 seconds. Though at 30 seconds, I think you're, you're extending it to a point where uh, it never really looks that good, so I limit it to about 25 seconds. 
And then if you're doing things like growing plants, flowers, home building projects and stuff like that, you know, three to five minutes. And then after that, you go into what I call the extremes where you know people have shot themselves uh, and done a time lapse of them you know one image a month for multiple years and you know 450 uh, requires about 20 25 years to photograph but if you have the patience good luck i don't so how many images are we going to be capturing if your frame rate is 30 frames a second and you want to create a video that's going to last 15 seconds, you're going to need 15 seconds times 30 or 450 images. That's about where you want to start. But I always give myself a buffer of, of about 5%. So 5% on either end, and that ends up with close to 500 images. If your frame interval is going to be two seconds, that's the interval between shots. To calculate the total time that you're going to be sitting around to do this sequence with a two second interval is simple math, and it ends up being 900 seconds or 15 minutes. So 15 minutes of sitting around capturing 450 images is basically a compression of 160, one to 60 ratio. So you've taken 15 minutes of time and you're gonna show it in 15 seconds. That is really what time lapse is all about. So we've spent a good 40 minutes and hopefully by now you understand what it is that we're trying to do. Now, how do we do this? We set up a camera and we set up the intervalometer. We've got our numbers pretty much established. So now you open up your camera's uh, you know, menu system. You go into time-lapse animation. This is on a Panasonic camera. There's similar kind of programs available on Sony cameras, on Canon cameras, etc. cetera. Uh, somewhere when you look for time-lapse, you will find the ability to do the sequence. And what you then do is basically go into time lapse shot, set your interval, your start time being now, and your image count. Basically, you can set that in a secondary menu. Once you've done it, go ahead, press your shutter button, and you're ready to start taking your images. So that's basically you know, what, what it's all about. It's fairly simple. Now, we talk about framing, but before we get into framing, let me just pause and see if we have any questions so far. Ali, do uh, we have any questions? Yes, yeah, Shiva, comment and some questions. Uh, first, uh, a comment from Martin. He said, it's interesting that you suggest having motion blur within a single image. Looking forward to seeing the end result. And then, okay. uh, here's a question from Dennis. What about night images or time-lapse astrophotography? Should you be using a ND filter for brighter objects like planets or bright stars? All right, that's a good question. So at night, uh, no, you're, you're, you're basically going to be exposing at about 15 seconds of exposure that does not require any kind of filtering. The only filters that I might use for night photography is if I'm in a high bottle area uh, where there is a lot of light pollution, uh, then I might put in a light pollution filter that's going to basically cut out any of the sodium and mercury vapor uh, light emission from you know, the cities and that haloing that you get because of uh, city light pollution. Apart from that, no, you do not need uh, any kind of filter. And, and if you were following what I was saying, that night photography, once you get into the realm of long exposures that are, you know, 10, 12, 15 seconds or more, then the whole philosophy of half the frame rate breaks down because there's no way for you to do it. So you basically allow for more fluid motion. 
and thereby longer frame, frame rate times. And then uh, one more question from Matt. Uh, can you repeat the promo code? Uh, the promo code for Platypod is S as in Sam, V as in Victor, two zero. Okay, and from Michael, have you used the Edelcrone system? If yes, how do you holy grail with Edelcrone? Um, okay, so the Edelcrone system I have used it, but only for the slider. I have not used the Edel Chrome to actually control the camera. Um, so when I'm using the Edel Chrome to use the slider, I am actually using pretty much sequential uh, things using the Edel Chrome software that is on the iOS uh, system. But it's... I tell you, if you if you're interested in doing sequential images with motion or animation, uh, there is a new product that you might want to look at. And I don't want to sway you away from the Edelchrome if you already spent a lot of money on it. Uh, the Benro Polaris is an absolutely phenomenal system that you might want to consider. But uh, yeah, I mean, we can go into the Edelchrome system if you want to give me a uh, shoot me an email. Uh, we can set up some time and discuss it. I don't think we want to discuss any one single product in this presentation, but I'd be most happy to discuss that with you. Yes, I do have the Edelchrome Slider 1, and I do use it, but uh, not as frequently as I'd like to. Anything else? And then uh, one more. Um, expand on bulb ramping. In practice, how is it done? All right. So in in practice, bulb ramping. Uh, look at it this way: there is a device that is reading the exposure of the ambient light, and it is then controlling the shutter of your camera while the camera is in bulb mode. So when you are in bulb mode, your aperture is kind of fixed in its open state, wherever you've set it, let's say F8, and the shutter can be fired for a sequence that varies in shutter speed for each subsequent frame. So the bulb ramping device says, okay, the exposure is F8.011. Now it's F8.012. Now it's F8.013. Now it's F8.014. So the light is becoming brighter and brighter. It reads that information and fires the shutter accordingly. So in, in, in bulb mode, remember, if you were to use a manual uh, trigger release, you can fire the shutter, it'll open, and then when you release it, the shutter closes. So you can vary that in very fine increments electronically. So if you have, instead of your fingers doing the triggering, you have a device that is doing the triggering, it can trigger it at any rate that it is capable of. And typically bulb ramping devices are capable of triggering at one one thousandth of an f-stop. Thank you, Shiv. Uh, no more questions for now. Okay. So the importance of framing. We all, you know, talk about, you know, framing your image and, you know, making sure that you use the rule of thirds and you use the golden ratios and all that good stuff. Well, in time lapse, it's also very important that you understand the concept of framing. So watch this video. So this is three days of work. It's indoors, it's in a controlled environment, and I'm done. I gotta throw this thing away. Why? Because I never considered that this tulip was going to go 
and grow this much and thereby grow out of the frame. So if you are going to be doing any kind of time lapse that is time lapse of subject matter that changes shape, form, etc., shoot loose, you can always crop back in. There is enough in your cameras today as far as resolution is concerned to create 4K video with even 50% of your frame being cropped away, you can still achieve it. So shoot loose, don't shoot tight. So normally when I'm presenting live, I ask people as to, you know, did they notice the flicker? And everybody will say, yes, yes, there was a lot of flicker. Well, in reality, there was no flicker at all. You had smoke, you had fire, you had fire moving, but in reality, this sequence has no flicker. How do you notice flicker? How do you see flicker? If you go back and look at this again, you will notice that the lights of the building, except the ones that were turning on and off, the rest of the lights of the building do not change at all during the sequence. So if light doesn't change, there is no flicker. Smoke and fire don't cause flicker. They are flickering in their own state, but there is no flicker. So here's what flicker looks like. This is a sequence of 450 images. You'll hear me use that term a lot. The blue graph on the top is the exposure using a Canon 50 millimeter lens on a Canon camera, 5D Mark IV. The bottom is exactly the same camera, pretty much the same sequence. Unfortunately, the sequence above was slightly out of focus, but the same sequence using a Zeiss 50 millimeter lens, and that's actually a Nikon Zeiss uh, lens adapted to the Canon because the Nikon lens has full manual control. And you can see the blue graph that represents the amount of exposure variation that is on the top versus the amount of exposure variation at the bottom. Why is this happening? Our cameras basically open and close our aperture for every exposure. So you open it up to the widest, you read the exposure, and then the aperture closes to whatever you've set it at. So let's say you set it to f8, and your camera lens is an f2.8, it'll open to 2.8, close to f8, open to 2.8, close to f8. Each time it closes down, it doesn't close down to f8, it's a mechanical device. So it may close to f8.1, it may close to f7.9, and so on and so forth. So you get this tremendous amount of variation. On a manual lens, once you've set the aperture to whatever it is, that's where it stays. So it doesn't open and close, and thereby you don't get any exposure variation from the aperture. You are going to ask, then why is that line not a straight line? Well, the problem is that the camera also has a mechanical shutter. And just as the aperture doesn't open and close to the same, there are variations in shutter speed. Though minuscule, it does exist. And that's the reason why the line at the bottom is not dead straight. I need to do a, a new slide and put a third sequence in there using a manual lens with a mirrorless camera. In the mirrorless cameras, you don't have that much of a shutter variation when you're using the electronic shutter. Yes, if you use the mechanical shutter, you'll get the same problem. But if you use the electronic shutter, the exposure variation is minuscule, in fact, barely perceptible. So we have aperture-related flicker. We have shutter-related flicker. We may have flicker because of the ambient light. If you're using AC lights like fluorescence or even incandescent lights that are AC, they will flicker. They will flicker at 60 hertz. It's just the nature of the beast.
outside, you've got shadows, you've got dapple light, those will also cause flicker. So you have to figure out ways on how you're going to best control flicker. Indoors, it becomes quite easy. Don't use lights that are fired by your AC current. Use lights that are DC driven. LED lamps are perfect. Uh, anything that is battery operated is, is absolutely fine. So if you are doing a sequence like that, which you saw of the tulips, yes, you went on and you saw that you know, the light did change in the, in the very end, but the light was fairly consistent because it was shot using LEDs. So manual lenses are the way to do it. And if you are using a DSLR, one other thing you want to do is to cover the viewfinder with some gaffer's tape because you don't want any light leaks because those light leaks also get represented as, as flicker. Once you've got all of this done, you know, you can bring it into software and you can basically get rid of all the flicker in software. There is a way that it does. And I'll just explain it to you in a moment. Your other options are you can actually do what's known as a D-click lens. You can take your lens and put, uh, if your lens has a way to check depth of field, it'll, when you press the depth of field button, your aperture will close down to whatever you've set it at. And at that point, you just twist the lens off the camera, not completely, but just so that the electronic contacts are broken. And then your lens will stay at whatever aperture you've set it at. And since everything else you're going to be doing in manual mode anyway, you don't have to continually read the exposure. Once it's set, it's set and you do it. Um, Deflickering in the product called LR Time Lapse, that's the software that I use and I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, what it does is it looks at the range and says, okay, the aperture was set at this. There are, there are variations of about a third stop, about two, you know, two thirds of a stop or whatever. And what it will do is it will adjust the exposure um, in a batch process to make sure that the flicker is completely eliminated. So this is the piece of software. It's written uh, by a guy in Germany. It's basically become the gospel uh, Bible of uh, time-lapse image creation and sequences. Uh, you can get it from my website. If you go to my website, which is www.shivverma.com, uh, go to products and discounts, it's there. Uh, you can get a basic license. You can always upgrade later if you want, but this is ideally suited. Now, LR time lapse does require you to have Lightroom. If you don't have Lightroom, please don't bother acquiring this product because it works in conjunction with Lightroom. And the LR time lapse does not stand for Lightroom time lapse. It's basically, you know, leveling and ramping. That's what it is. So it levels up your exposure and it ramps the exposure as needed. So that's why it's called LR time lapse. People say, well, it's Lightroom time lapse. No, it isn't. It's totally different. What do I use? Since we are creating video, and video is fairly computer intensive, I'm now using an M1 uh, 10 core CPU with a 32 core GPU, 64 gig of memory. Uh, and I have a one terabyte SSD because I was not going to spend another $400 to get a two terabyte SSD. I use a 32 terabyte disk array and then I use a Wacom tablet and I use a BenQ uh, SW271C, which is a 4K monitor. Now, the, the one thing about the BenQ monitor, which I really, really enjoy, and I think I mentioned it before, is that it is 99% Adobe RGB. Uh, the, the color rendition is exceptional. The refresh rate is exceptional. What you don't want is a slow refreshing monitor when you're doing video. If you're doing video editing and if you have a slow refresh monitor, it's going to drive, not that you can't do it, you can do it, but it will drive you up the wall. So get a monitor that has a high refresh rate, get a monitor that is at least 2K, uh, BenQ makes monitors that are 2K, but a 4K monitor is ideal because today even YouTube will give you higher priority if you put 4K video up 
for them to be able to broadcast out to their audience. Um, <clears throat> Now, the, the one thing that I do want to mention, since this is a BenQ uh, webinar, uh, BenQ will send out to all the registrants an email with a discount code that will be applicable for some of their products. Uh, if you, you know, get that, just don't discard that email because it does contain a discount that uh, would be worth your uh, you know, looking at and at least, you know, trying some of their products out if you don't already use them. Uh, on my end, I do a lot of photo workshops, uh, both uh, internationally as well as nationally. I've been dormant for about uh, two, two and a half years. But next year, I'm going to be doing a trip to Tanzania in September, followed by a trip to Namibia. I have two spots left on my Tanzania Safari and four spots left on the Namibia Safari, which is here. You can go look at these also on my website if you're interested. I'd love to have some of you join. Um, my workshops for, for these kind of trips are very exclusive. Uh, we make sure that every photographer has a full row uh, on Safari vehicles. So we're not, you know, two people to a row where you're trying to photograph over somebody else. Uh, it's just one person per row and uh, you know, open vehicles so you can get really great opportunities. If you do go to my website, you can look at my blog or go to my Facebook page, you'll see uh, my Namibia trip from this year, the images that we were able to get. Um, at this point, before I talk about light, uh, LR time lapse and how we use it, um, Ali, are there any more questions? Uh, yes, Shiva. Two more questions. Uh, one from Audrey. Uh, wouldn't using video be more efficient than a camera and reduce the speed of the clip or even delete some frames? Uh, if you want to do something like that, I would suggest you give it a try and see how tedious it is. Uh, I think it's better to shoot and then, you know, compile rather than shoot and then try and get rid of. One if I got the question Alan. correct. Gotcha. Go ahead. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, so uh, yes, Audrey said, thank you. Uh, one more from Alan. Uh, why can you not use any auto lens and turn it and or the camera onto manual only? Uh, well, you can when you when you put your camera into manual mode. The camera allows you to set exposure, shutter speed, and aperture to whatever you want. The camera doesn't try and do anything on its own. The lens, the only thing you can turn your lens to manual is to focus. So you cannot, unless you have a lens that has the ability to manually adjust aperture, like some of the new uh, Panasonic lenses that are the S series lenses, you can actually, uh, it has a clutch and you can move the clutch back to put the camera into a manual aperture mode. Yes, those will work. But other lenses, you, you can't, Turning, making a camera go from auto to manual or aperture prior to manual doesn't make the lens a manual lens. It only makes your exposure manual. Thank you, Shiv. Okay. All right. So as far as your images, now that you have all of your images and you know, you've sort of culled out the first two or three frames and you the last two or three frames, which you know may have had some movement because of your pressing the shutter. Uh, again, my recommendation is that you use your finger to press the shutter and get rid of those two or three frames rather than hook up a, uh, you know, a, a trigger, uh, a remote release, because those tend to dangle. And when they dangle, they will move. When they move, they'll cause shakes. So it's better just press the shutter, let your camera stabilize, let it do its sequence, and then at the end, when you press it again, 
Yes, you will generate some movement so you can get rid of those few frames and that's no problem. What LR time lapse does is it, it sucks all these images in, you, you import them into LR time lapse, it'll, it'll analyze them and it'll generate what are considered keyframes. And keyframe generation is nothing more than identifying those frames where there is a change that takes place from the previous to the next. And it is those keyframes that you will need to manually edit to make sure that you are deriving some sort of sequential rationale of how you want your sequence to look. You may in fact want to create animation using those keyframes. You may want to adjust exposure. You may want to modify the white balance using those keyframes. Once that is done, the keyframes are established. All those changes are actually done in Lightroom. So what LR Time Lapse will do is it'll create those keyframes and then you export all your images into Lightroom. Once they're in Lightroom, Lightroom will show you because those keyframes get star rated. It, you pull those up, you make all your adjustments just only on the keyframes. If there's not much variation in your sequence, then there's a keyframe only in the beginning and at the end. You make your changes, you bring it back into Lightroom. Now what light, uh, into LR time lapse. What LR time lapse will now do is it'll look at the changes that you have made and it will compute a gradual change in every image on the sequence to get them all to look as though the transition was totally transparent. So the auto transitioning basically modifies very slightly where needed the changes that you have created on your keyframes. Once that is all done, right, you can basically then decide whether you want to do any deflickering, if you want to make any other modifications. And once you do that, you export it as video and you can export it all the way from you know basic 1080p all the way up to 6k and then you can render it now just remember that even 450 frames a 10 second video if you are going to be doing it in full 10 bit or full 60 using full 16 bit tiff files will take a considerable amount of time unless you have a good and fast computer. So don't get discouraged, but it does take some time. The Holy Grail is basically uh, something where we call a, it's a flawless transition going from day to night or night to day. And this is you know, great for doing sunrises and sunsets. It's, it's a good experiment. Once you have got used to creating standard time lapses, go experiment with some of this. Here's an example of a day to night transition. And this is a sequence of day to night, but also with the tide moving out where the exposure really changed because of the reflectivity of the water. So once you do this kind of thing and you get into the or let's say you get the bug of doing time-lapse, then you want to start looking at automating things, putting some motion control in, you know, single axis motion where you just go from left to right or right to left. Then you go left to right, right to left, and turn your camera across and to, you know, 180 degrees or, or less or more. And then you can go into full three-way, so all kinds of animation are possible, just like in good videography. But here you control it in a very specific time-based manner, unlike in video where you can actually use a jib and swing it any way you want. The products here at the bottom is what I use. It's a six-foot track. Uh, it's belt-driven, um, uses a platform to mount your camera, uses stepper motors to move it, and is computer-controlled to let you do uh, the time-lapse sequence.
The product on the right has an inbuilt uh, computerized system. It's a single axis, so it'll rotate uh, the, the camera. Or if you don't want the camera to rotate, it rotates a little pulley at the bottom that you can use with a rope and it, you can then move this entire unit left or right. It's a kludgy way of doing you know, one axis track, which you can do with a track anyway. Uh, three axis motion control, now you're talking about uh, incremental dollars. You're starting around about 800 to 1,000 dollars. And from there on, it only goes up into you know, four, five, six, and even 22,000 dollars of time-lapse uh, equipment. But to start with, you know, do the basics, and as you get more and more familiar with it, you can create time-lapse where the photography part has no motion, but you can generate motion after the fact. Just remember one thing, a 1080p video is basically not a lot of pixels. All the other pixels that are available in your camera can be utilized for artificially generating all kinds of motion effects. So it's a, it's a topic for another day, but it's something that you can definitely do and achieve in, in, in really fancy ways. Uh, here's an example. This was done with the Genie that you saw earlier, uh, motion control. Tell me if you think that this looks good. Um, the answer is yes, it looks good. It could have been improved. Here's where you do two things. This is purely time lapse, but the sequence is 15 seconds long or somewhere thereabouts. So, what you would do in a sequence like this is that you would do the time lapse and then you would take a video of exactly the same duration, not time lapse, an actual video. What is happening over here is that the clouds are moving at one rate, which is a smooth movement. Whereas the ocean, because of the waves, looks far more rapid compared to the clouds. And that difference is you know, something that your eyes have to get a little used to and can be a, a, just a tad uncomfortable. But if I was to take this time lapse, generate the video, the time lapse video, and then overlay the ocean just as a video, it would be a much slower movement in the ocean, and thereby you would balance the top with the bottom. Does that make sense? I mean, hopefully it does. If it doesn't, talk to me later. Then you can do, as I said, nighttime time lapses. And there was a question earlier. Uh, this is nothing more than a city scene. This is in New York, this Hudson River, and just a time lapse. The, the importance over here is to watch the moon rise over and, and go over the clouds. Uh, distractions, of course, yes, all the lights flashing around are more interesting, but you forget to look at the moon. You watch it a second time, you observe something else, and that's part of the thrill of time lapse. Each time you get to see something different that you didn't see the first time. So unlike a movie that you watch and you've seen it, time lapse you watch over and over again, even though it's a short duration, and each time you pick up something different. You can do something like this, you know, time lapse of, uh, of the sky, and, and, and the stars and, and all that good stuff and meteors going through and whatever, um, great. But there's no anchor. You want an anchor. Even if it's a small anchor, you want for nighttime photography, you want there to be an anchor. And this is just a quick representation of even just in the corner, a little thing, a bit of ground to, to ground out your image makes for a far better scene than something which is just purely sky. So you'll be tempted to do that, but you know, make sure that you at least have some anchoring elements in the time lapses that you create. And then finally, you can do some titles, add some music to it, and you know, create a video that has uh, all the elements that our, our sensory perception will, will enjoy. 
All right, with that, uh, I'm done with my presentation. We will take some more questions, but before we do, if you would like a copy of my presentation notes, please email me at my address, which is sv at uh, There is one condition to the receiving of notes is that I put you on my mailing list for uh, future information. I don't send more than an email once a month, if that, sometimes maybe two, uh, but that's, that's about it. Um, my book, which was published in 2014, is available from uh, my website, it'll take you to the Apple Bookstore, and that's where you buy it. Um, it's a little outdated, but it still has a lot of good information. It's far more detailed. Bear in mind, the presentation that I've done today um, is a compression of you know, a full day. Uh, basically, that's a full day workshop uh, to do this. Um, the uh, LR Time Lapse product, you can get what's known as a private license for $114 and a pro license for $289. Uh, you can check that out. You can use a trial version to see it. And once again, if you are interested in any Platypod products, uh, there is a discount of 20% using SV20. And you will be receiving an email with the discount for the BenQ products, which unfortunately I don't have right now. But you will get an e email with all of that information. So with that, uh, if there are any more questions, I'd be most happy to answer those. So one question from Audrey. If you're using a non-DSLR, the process is the same, correct? Absolutely, yes. I mean, mirrorless cameras, run, whether you call them non-DSLRs, that's, that's fine. Point and shoot cameras, as long as you have the ability to do frame by frame capture. Uh, and if it doesn't have a built in intervalometer, then you can use an external intervalometer and connect it up, and, and that'll work just fine. Uh, from Dennis, uh, for the night time lapse, do you manually adjust your exposure times for the changing light conditions when generating a sequence without star trailing? No, you don't. Once you've set your exposure, you just leave it where it is. The only time you modify or change exposure is if you're doing a holy grail where, you're, where the exposure is in fact changing. Just remember one thing, if you are shoot, photographing stars or star trails or, or you know, the Milky Way, your ex, once your exposure is, is established, it's not going to change because there is no other change in light. So nothing changes. Uh, and if, you're, from... if there's anybody anybody confused about this, as I said, you know, don't hesitate to send me an email saying, you know, you, you'd like to understand this better, you want to know more about it, or you want to go into more detail. I'll be most happy to discuss it with you. Sorry, are you asking something? Or no problem. Uh, a follow up from Dennis. What about uh, astronomical twilight to night images? Um, yes, there you would. But when you are in, you know, astro twilight, uh, the the number of stars that you're going to have visible is is, you know, far less than when you have, you know, total darkness. And if you want to do that kind of a transition, uh, yes, you can. And the amount of exposure variation is probably going to be from, you know, a five second exposure going all the way up to 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, and that's okay. Remember one thing that unless you are trying to normalize the exposure, if you want to show it going from, you know, bright to dark, then you can always leave it at an intermediate. So let's say your exposure for the twilight was five seconds and your nighttime exposure is 15 seconds. You can either ramp up 
you know, in quarter stop increments manually, or you can, you know, use a ramping device. But to show that difference, what you're basically doing is that five second exposure is going to look properly exposed, as is the 15 second exposure is going to look proper, properly exposed. So the 15 second exposure is going to appear brighter than the five second exposure. And that could look a little odd. So you want it to look as though it was bright and then became dark. So you may want to start with, you know, 12 seconds in the beginning and leave it at 12 seconds and then pull the exposure down on the starting end by a little and pull it up by about a quarter stop on the ending end. So it looks like there is a transition. You don't want it to look like a flat exposure. Okay, and uh, one from Michael. What about focus is shallow or deep depth of field the best? Well, if you if you are, uh, well, it depends what you're shooting, right? If I'm going to be shooting the night sky and the stars, I want to take advantage of as much light as I can gather. So I'm going to keep my lens wide open, you know, f2.8, even f1.8 or 1.4 if I can afford the lens. I'm not worried about depth of field. I'm focused to infinity and I'm done. But if you're doing other kinds of time lapse, if you're doing time lapses of uh, you know flowers that that are going to bloom, yes, your depth of field is going to be uh, you know f8 or f11, and that is really subject matter dependent. I mean, time lapse does not say there's a hard and fast rule, um, you know, unless you you may specifically say, yes, I want to photograph this flower and there's a background, I want the background to be blurry. So I might shoot it at F4 and make the background go blurry. Or I might shoot it at F8 and move the background even further away so it looks, you know, blurry. Those are, those are choices you make just as you do in straight photography. There is no difference. Those are choices that uh, are completely in your control and you know, whatever your heart's desire is. And uh, a comment from Audrey, uh, enjoy the presentation. The FPS is quite helpful. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, a comment from Audrey, uh, enjoy the presentation. The FPS is quite helpful. Oh, thank you very much. So, you know, we, we will look, I mean, maybe we'll discuss down the road, maybe a year from now, once you've had some practice, uh, we can do a more uh, detailed uh, webinar on, on you know, time-lapse assembly, uh, particularly as it pertains to variable exposures and things of that sort. Um, but for right now, uh, my suggestion to those of you who are still there is take a scoop of ice cream, Put it on a plate, light it with uh, some LED lights, uh, put a bit of food coloring, and uh, you know, let the ice cream melt, and you'll be surprised as to how interesting that video is. Uh, put a drop of you know two different colors and let them blend together, and uh, you know, it's uh, it doesn't give you a high actually, but it gives you a visual high. Another question here. Uh, if you wanted to zoom, how would you integrate during shooting or in post production? If you want to zoom, do it in post production because during shooting, you will never be able to time it such that it'll look good. So, what you would do is you would assemble your video in its entirety and then set, you know, a couple of keyframes. Uh, use those keyframes to start the zoom, use a keyframe to end the zoom, uh, 
And then, you know, if you want to do a double where you zoom in, then zoom back out, you can set your three keyframes to do it. And then let LR time lapse handle the individual sequencing of the frames in between. You, you manually, there's no way you can do it. Uh, it'll drive you nuts. You have to let it let automation take care of that. Okay, Shiv, uh, some thank yous coming in. Um, I'll hold off another minute if anybody has a last minute question. Well, for those of you who are still there, uh, you know, thank you for coming and joining us. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm open to any future requests or questions that you may have because I'm not going to take this information with me to my grave. I might as well give it away when I can. Okay, Shiv, that looks like the last of the questions. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, is email the best way to? Yes, uh, email is the best way. And if you forget my email, I have a contact uh, link on my website. You're most welcome to use that. Uh, everything is tied to the website. And, uh, you know, all my social media is also available through the website. So please feel free uh, to use any of those methods to get in touch. Okay, uh, looks like that's all the questions. Uh, Shiv, from, on behalf of BenQ, we want to thank you for this very informative and entertaining webinar. Uh, it's great having you. I hope we can feature you again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. You take care and thank you, BenQ. And thanks to all the attendees. Thank you, everybody. Good night.